Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us on uh, Logistics Executive TV. I'm joined today by a gentleman who has had over 30 years plus experience in the uh, commercial and industrial property space. And he's uh, currently here in the Middle East, uh, based here, uh, but previously of uh, of Australia. And I'm pleased to welcome Michael Fenton. Michael, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, Kim. Pleasure to be here. Good stuff, and Malky, you're the Director of Cross-Border and Transactions uh, for Industrial and Logistics at Savills. Give us a bit of a heads up about Savills. Uh, well, Savills is a uh, global real estate services uh, provider. We're uh, listed on the uh, the London uh, Stock Exchange and, and have a global footprint um, servicing uh, uh, both investor clients, occupier clients across the property spectrum. Uh, you mentioned my background's industrial um, with a bit of commercial as well, but we also uh, cover you know, hotels, retail, um, you know, residential, and um, uh, across the full spectrum of services as well, sales, leasing, valuation, property management, uh, building uh, services, uh, facilities management. So, yeah, we do it all. So, so Michael, tell us a little bit about the the role and you're the director of cross border transactions. What does that involve? Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, Kim, it's to twofold what we do: looking after both occupier clients and investor clients. Um, and and my role's no different. Um, based here in the Middle East, um, there's obviously a lot of uh, Middle Eastern uh, capital that invests in the, the logistics sector. Uh, globally, so part of my remit is uh, is working with that capital, uh, helping them to identify investment opportunities um, in markets, particularly back into uh, the Australian market, but also other parts of Asia Pacific as well. Um, and from the occupier client side of uh, things, I work with um, uh, logistics companies, manufacturing companies, uh, looking to either expand. Uh, or set up their uh, operations uh, here in the Middle East, uh, but particularly uh, in the GCC countries and more so uh, in Dubai, where I'm currently based. Okay. So just a little bit about the demand drivers for warehousing space and, say, Dubai, GCC, uh, and then maybe you can give us a bit of a heads up on how that compares uh, to the rest of the world currently, if you can, if you could do that. Sure. Um, well, I suppose the comparisons between Dubai and the GCC and globally uh, are all fairly similar uh, in terms of what we've experienced in the logistics sector, certainly since um, since the COVID pandemic. Um, uh, we obviously experienced you know, a global impact on supply chains, um, which really forced, uh, forced a lot of businesses to sort of um, reconsider how they uh, how they operated their supply chains, and um, consequently, as you know, most sort of started to look at having to hold more uh, inventory on stock, which was forced upon them. Um, we also had uh, a huge acceleration in the uptake of uh, online retail sales, certainly as a percentage of, of total retail sales, uh, as, as people were forced. Uh, into uh, into buying product online with uh, without the ability to physically go into uh, uh, to retail shops to to buy products. So many late adopters um, of the uh, online technology were forced into that. And what we've what we've seen is those late adopters have now uh, embraced um, e-commerce online shopping as a way of uh, of, of moving forward um, uh, with their purchases. So. Historically, most uh, most developed countries had um, their um, you know, their percentage of online sales versus total retail sales around fifteen to twenty percent. Uh, we're seeing that certainly accelerate up over thirty percent going forward. Oh. So, so we saw the massive spike, which uh, correlated with the huge e-commerce trend during the pandemic last few years. Uh, as you're saying, warehousing space became of a premium. Uh, what what are you seeing now with the trends and developments taking place in the market now? What, what what's the variation? 
Well, it's really um, a, a need for for, for more uh, for more warehousing stock. Um, there's a, a bit of a rule of thumb that um, every uh, increase in population of one percent requires uh, an extra half a percent increase in the total warehouse space for an area. So that's um, yeah, in markets like Dubai that has recently seen such a huge spike in population growth. Um, that's creating that additional need for warehousing space. Um, the type of um, uh, warehousing space that's required is also changing. Um, with with those changes we talked about earlier with uh, with e-commerce, um, consumer demand expectations have also changed fairly dramatically. Uh, probably wasn't that long ago, maybe as recently as five or six years ago, that when you bought something online, um, if you received it um, within a week, that was uh, a bit of a win, um, or certainly within uh, you know, five to seven days. These days, uh, consumer expectations are pretty much uh, same-day delivery um, for, for most types of consumer-grade products. Um, so that's forced uh, a change in uh, businesses uh, in terms of how they operate their supply chains. And in many cases, we've seen uh, companies pivot from having you know, one large distribution centre that services a metropolitan area to uh, a number of smaller um, fulfillment centres closer into the population bases um, so they can meet those delivery um, expectations of customers of that same day delivery. Um, so that's been a, a noticeable change. Um, there are challenges that come with that, um, certainly in terms of finding the space um, um, in, in areas that um, are, are more highly concentrated with population bases. Um, and what was also changed with that is um, those, those, those infill areas are generally more expensive. Um, and as a consequence, uh, you know, the rents that are paid uh, by these e-commerce groups has, has gone up um, in comparison. So we're seeing one of the one of the other trends, uh, or very similar trend in terms of food delivery as well as your normal FMCG yep. componentry and, and the deliveries, uh, mobile phones, et cetera, and electric components for food delivery. Uh, here, of course, one of the big ones with all these dark kitchens everywhere, which are effectively uh, converted warehouses uh, with um, kitchens de designing and, and delivering food for up to 100 different restaurants. Uh, and, of course, they've got to be close to where, to where the population is. So I, I suppose it's the same with commercial property for holding anything. The challenge is you want to be close to the residential areas, but who wants to have a warehouse uh, near their residential uh, area, I guess? So uh, a continuous uh, stressful challenge. Yeah, and it's um, it's it's really uh, businesses trying to adapt. And as you say, the, the challenge in, in finding space closer in um is uh is, is prohibitive in, in in a lot of markets um one thing that is happening um probably not so much here in um in the UAE or, or the GCC but certainly in in other developed markets around the world uh in 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 cities with you know highly concentrated population bases is to go to to multi-level warehousing um Firstly, because of the, the the huge cost of the land um, um, that the development sits on, um, but also the lack of land supply um, in those highly valuable areas. So, um, you know, markets like Hong Kong, it's not unusual to find industrial buildings that are you know, 10, oh, yeah. 12, 15 uh, storeys high. Um, um, it, it's it's more common, I suppose, to have them two, three, or four four stories high, um, and that's a that's a direct response to those uh, consumer demands of of delivery expectations, um, but also a function of, of of lack of supply in a lot of those markets. Uh, the challenge with that is um, uh, the efficiencies um, and the cost of construction uh, in multi-level warehousing is obviously not the same as a single level facility. Um, so e-commerce groups have to adapt um, their operations um, to those challenges. Okay. I guess that leads us, thanks for that. I, I guess that leads us into when we're talking about layouts, uh, efficiency for warehouses and DCs, functionality. Um, is there much of a demand from investors and customers to be cognizant and, and build in um, recognition of ESG 
Uh, so environmental factors, uh, cost efficiency, uh, eco-friendly use of uh, of, uh, of energy, et cetera. Is that, is that a big factor or is that yet to come? No, no, absolutely. That's uh, It's been trending certainly in the industrial sector for the past few years, obviously led off really by um, by the commercial sector and uh, Green Star ratings, lean energy ratings, um, you know, Nearly every uh, major corporate has, um, you know, stated in their mission, their corporate missions, that they're going to reduce their carbon footprint um, and have a strong focus on uh, ESG principles um, in their day-to-day operations. And um, that's certainly the case, um, if not more so in logistics uh, businesses, e-commerce businesses and the like. Um, that do have fairly large carbon footprints, um, certainly out of um, you know the transportation side of the business, which um, uh, which accounts for a lot of that. But in terms of the buildings themselves, uh, yeah, absolutely. Any energy efficient lighting, um, it's not really much of a, uh, an issue in this part of the this part of the world. But you know, rainwater harvesting, that type of thing, um, is certainly uh, a focus in in a lot of other um, in a lot of other markets. But you know, certainly solar energy um, is very relevant in in this part of the world as well. Um, to uh, to reduce the carbon footprint for uh, for these um, e-commerce and logistics operators. Yeah, thanks. Uh, interesting. I mean, so we're seeing um, a lot of these new builds here with solar panels on the roof. Uh, you know, ten years ago it wasn't so prevalent. Are you seeing that now here for uh, energy conservation? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's if uh, if it's not um, if it's not in a building, it's being incorporated into the design of the new buildings. Um, the tenants can uh, can install solar panels and and run them back through into their uh, um, their uh, electricity supply. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, you know, other factors like the energy efficient lighting they're using, um, the translucent panels on the roof to improve natural light. Um, are all factors that are being incorporated into uh, the design of warehouses um, in this part of the world going forward. And, you know, there's certainly been, you know, a marked um, institutionalisation is probably the best way to describe uh, construction now going forward, largely probably driven by the um, the multinational companies that are setting up base here in the region um, and the um, the expectations uh, and requirements that they come with when it comes to uh, warehouse design, construction, uh, and so the global goals that they're looking to reach. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, sort of leads me into the other thing I'm interested to know uh, is the impact of is automation really kicking in yet in this market? And can you could do a throwback to the APAC market in particular? Australia, um, where cost of labour is going up. I know that they've just done a, a minimum wage increase there with the budget, uh, so the cost of labour is certainly going up in places like Australia. How's that comparing here and how, what effect is that having on the utilisation of automation and warehouses in particular? Yeah, look, it's it's a really interesting uh, question, Kim. It's, it's Look, it's certainly uh, quite apparent that the adoption uh, and utilization of automation and robotics in uh, in uh, warehousing facilities here is not um, at the level you see certainly in Asia Pac and, and definitely in Australia. Um, you, you alluded to one of the main reasons uh, for that is uh, labour labour costs. Now, certainly in markets like Australia, where the cost of um, of labour is uh, a lot more expensive, um, so the payback on automation. Um, would be a lot quicker when we're talking about, um, uh, you know, robotics in particular in uh, in running a logistics facility. Whereas over here, the cost of uh, cost of labour is uh, is certainly a lot cheaper by relative standards. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think the comparison is not there yet. Um, regardless. I think there is still a trend towards um, automation. This part of the world certainly has um, a lot of uh, uh, tech-savvy people that are are looking at how to get improvements and efficiencies into the operation of warehouses. And I'm certain that there's going to be more and more automation coming. Um, It's probably a function of, yeah, the the payback period um, uh, being a lot longer, um, 
but yeah, the other factor is you, when, when you've got groups that are looking at automation, the the cost of that can sometimes be uh, multiples of what the actual building uh, fabric costs. So they need to have you know fairly long security um, of tenure in a facility um, to 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 ensure that uh, that can be amortised over the life cycle. Um, whereas you know you've got you've got leasehold uh, land here that doesn't afford necessarily um, the long term um, security of uh, of tenure that you have in freehold owned jurisdictions, uh, you know, like Australia. Yeah, I, I've noticed on our consulting business here in in Asia and Australia that uh, the demand for um, design taking account of, you know, where the optimization can take place with automation is, is very high. Of course, that would cross over in the advisory that uh, your organisation gives to a client when they're looking to establish a, a new build and the options that you need to come up with for them to evaluate from a mm. uh, both an ESG, um, a cost saving and uh, just a common sense point of view. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Michael, been great. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, really. Uh, Really interesting discussion about where things are happening. Uh, before we wrap up, maybe a bit of an insight from you as to where you see things going, uh, the big trends over the next year or two in regards to warehousing, um, investment in warehousing, design, any big picture items that you want to cast out there as to what you think is going to be happening in the next year or two? Well, I think from an occupier side in this uh, in this region, we're going to see continued growth um, in uh, demand for for logistics uh, and manufacturing space, um, this region um, is really well positioned um, from a certainly from a geographic standpoint with um, access to you know, uh, Africa, large parts of Asia, and certainly Europe. Um, so we're going to continue to see a lot of businesses set up their operations here, or certainly expand their footprints. Um, with that is going to come that increased pressure in demand um, and, and and upward pressure on rents. Um, so, you know, from a developer perspective here in um, in the uh, in the Middle East, that's a great uh, um, you know, great opportunity. Um, the challenge is, you know, the delivery of product over here does take a little longer than you see in other markets in Asia and, and Europe, where the construction time um, and certainly through the the initial planning phase as well uh, can take up to six months longer. Um, so a lot of companies coming here um, do find that um, challenging. So developers that have the preparedness to to build on a speculative basis. Um, logistics facilities that come with um, adaptability um, to, uh, to 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 change uh, size configurations and the like to to meet tenant demand are going to be very well positioned uh, because they'll be ahead of the market and capturing that demand um, at the outset. Um, we're also going to see you know huge. Um, Amounts invested and, and have already been invested in transport infrastructure in the region. Um, you know, you've got some world leading uh, ports here already in the UAE, in Abu Dhabi, and obviously at, um, at Jebel Ali. Um, the Etihad Rail is another fantastic story for the uh, the freight sector here in the UAE. Um, and obviously, from an air freight perspective as well, it's uh, it's market leading in this region. So, um, I think all signs point to you know, continued strong growth uh, in the logistics sector for uh, for years to come. Yeah, sure, I can hear hear what you're saying. The, the recruitment side of our business is is really uh, bumping up in regards to especially the likes of Saudi, the ports there as well. There's always been continuous demand in Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Oman, of course, coming up with ASEAD and the ports they've had traditionally there, the ASEAD uh, and Oman shipping. So, yeah, it's, it's, you're right. It's, it's There's a lot of demand. Um, fantastic to get some insight from you. Look forward to hearing from you again, perhaps before the end of the year, just to see how those predictions have been going and uh, how supply is meeting demand. Uh, Michael Pendant, Director of Cross-Border Transactions, Industrial and Logistics at Savills. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, where, where can people get hold of you, Michael, if they want some advice and some input from you? Oh, thanks, Kim. Uh, yeah, probably best on email. So, yeah, michael.fenton at savills.me for Middle yeah, East. Good job. And LinkedIn, of course. Uh, LinkedIn, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me there as well. 
Good stuff. Well, all the best. Thanks again, Michael. And thanks, everybody, for joining us on Logistics Executive TV.